Mo Berg was many things. A Princeton grad, a speaker of 10 languages, and a major league catcher. But the title that draws the most attention is likely as an undercover spy during the height of World War II. On this episode, we will learn how this genius ball player played a massive role in Europe as a member of the OSS and how he was able to supply the United States with vital photographs from behind enemy lines. I'm Jake Snorielli, and this is Last from the Past. Hello and welcome to Laughs from the Past, Season 6, Episode 7, Mo Berg, the Spy Behind Home Plate. This is Season 6, Baseball's Greatest Stories. My name is Jimmy. My co-host here is Jake. Lucas O'Brien wrote this episode, and we've got a lot to talk about. First, I said I didn't know who Mo Berg was in my head, and I think to Luke before this. I, I know The Catcher was a spy story because it became a movie with Paul Rudd. But I didn't finish the movie because it was kind of too slow and I was on the airplane and needed something faster. Do you know this story at all, Jake? I know you talking about The Catcher who was a spy from the Paul Rudd movie. <laughs> so I've told you about it before. Yes. Cool, 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 cool. All Catchers are kind of spies, right? Ooh, interesting. All catchers are spies. No? Secret signals, sending messages, being all secretive. Right, but spy would it implies you're spying on something. And I don't think a catcher necessarily is spying on the other team. Maybe they're spying on where the batter's feet are. But that could also just be called looking. Yeah, it's it's a it's a fine line, <laughs> fine line between catcher and spy. Yep. Another quick note in the in the in the intro, your last lines were you know from behind enemy lines, and I just go watch behind enemy lines with Owen Wilson and Gene Hackman. It's just an always go watch that movie. One of the better ones okay. out there. Wow! Wow! Oh wow! Oh wow! Is that his only it's like serious action role? role? Yeah, I think so. And it's pretty good. I don't know why he stayed away from it's it. It's a good movie. And Gene Hackman retired after that movie, too, so it ended some careers. Damn. He must have ruffled some feathers. Yeah. Mo Berg is a great name. Strong name. High and Sounds tight. like uh, it could be a rapper these days. Mo Berg. Yeah, but no E on the end of Mo. So Mo, yes, no E, yeah, just Mo. Mo Berg. Yeah. What do you need, baby? Mo Berg. Yeah, it's good. I like that name. Let's get into it. Ooh, Mo Berg was born in Harlem in 1902. I am currently in Harlem as we record this episode. So maybe I'm in Mo Berg's first apartment. There's a chance. There's not a chance that you're in it. There's a chance that I'm in it. I'm, I'm not saying no. He was the third child of Bernard Berg. <clears throat> it's almost a better name, Bernard Berg. Yeah, I'm easily Bernard Berg. The alliteration and Bernard's a powerful name, or it's a really weak name. Depends no, on the person. Bernard Berg could have went by Bernie Berg, and that is awesome. Bernie Berg strong, yeah. And his mom's name was Rose Tasker. Not a good name. Terrible. Worst name. (laughs) It's a horrible name. They were Jewish immigrants from the Ukraine who came to the U.S. seeking economic opportunity and religious freedom. The Bergs moved to Newark, New Jersey, where Bernard opened a pharmacy. Education was paramount. And Bernard, in particular, expected his kids to pursue 
one of three professions. Lawyer, doctor, teacher. Damn. Teacher kind of sucks. Like, there's not a lot of money in that one. Lawyer and doctor, there's money. Lawyer, you're kind of... Didn't didn't want his kids to be a pharmacist like he was? No. Maybe that's maybe he calls himself a doctor, so that's what he's saying there. Does that count as doctor? Uh, yeah, that's what I, I don't know. Yeah. From his early days, Mo had a rocket arm and a photographic memory. As a seven-year-old, he played baseball on a church team using the pseudonym <laughs> Runt Wolf. <laughs> mm. Why did a seven-year-old need a pseudonym to play church baseball? Why was it Runt Wolf? <laughs> So Runt Wolf is the question. I mean, was it was it because he was Jewish and he couldn't play with like the Catholic kids or something like that? I guess church isn't Jewish. It's synagogue, right? Or do they still say right? church? I don't know. I don't know either. Or maybe that could be it. But <laughs> yeah, I'm going to be called Runt. I mean, Runt Wolf was still not the way to go. It's a, I like it. It sounds like the bad guy in any movie. Runt wolf. No, I mean, I think runt is like the the runt of the litter. Yeah, bad dog. Bad guy. That's not good. It's like a small, tiny, weak dog. Well, well imagine you're a little kid and there's a guy on the other baseball team and he's really good. He's the best there. And you got an inkling that he's illegal. And then his name is Runt Wolf. Fucking Runt Wolf. That's a bad guy. He got that nickname from his mom. <laughs> he excelled on the field and in the classroom, initially studying at New York University. He transferred to Princeton University, where he was a star on the baseball team and in the modern languages department. The popular idiosyncratic scholar athlete turned down an offer to join one of Princeton's exclusive eating clubs. Purposely, after being told that while he'd be more than welcome, he shouldn't think of bringing other Jews around. Okay, a lot to unpack in that fucking paragraph. Okay. So he's at Princeton, right? And he gets the invite to, <laughs> to join an exclusive eating club. Right. Which didn't exist. And this was just four guys who ate together at one lunch table and didn't let anyone else sit with them because they were very racist. <laughs> that's, what it, that's what it seems like. It does does sound like a little bit of a racist dinner club. Um, Sounds a lot like I mean, the, uh, can't the, sit here party. I mean, the only other thing that comes to mind that I, I think people could relate to, unless we hear more about the dinner club, is the... what's uh, There's an Office episode where... It's Pam, Oscar, and Toby, and they they do the the finer things the Scranton, club. yeah, the Scranton finer things club. Like that's so we it, we've either got a loser club or we've got the front for another club going on. Well, they didn't want they didn't want Mo to bring any other Jews around, but they were cool with him as long as he probably kept the pseudonym Runt Wolf. Runty, so dumb. Would you call him Runty or Wolfy? Hey, we normally want to let Jews in, but you're pretty good at baseball and languages. <laughs> that does sound like an exclusive eating club. You need a mouthful of sausage yeah. as you're saying it. <laughs> <laughs> so he graduates from Princeton and the Brooklyn Robins, which are now the Los Angeles Dodgers, and the New York Giants were interested in recruiting him in part because they thought he'd help draw the city's relatively large Jewish population. And I'm guessing the other part is because he was good at baseball. It's cool. Damn. It's smart. So the one... What if there so was this another is, catcher... What if there was another catcher who was even a little better, but he was just a good Catholic boy? Like, don't hey, want him. kid, good ball player. We're taking the Jew. Yeah, don't want them. That's like, you know, people don't want Tebow for the baggage. Sometimes you want guys for the baggage. So he's getting offers left and right. 
He gets one offer to be part of the exclusive eating club, but he can't bring any Jews around. And now we have baseball teams offering him to come play for him because they want him to bring all the other Jews around. How about that? Symmetry. So he joined the Robins and played in the minor leagues. His technical skills and lack of offensive power inspired the phrase, good field, no hit. Is that still a phrase? Been, been there. Um, I mean, it's not really a good phrase, but I, someone said it. I, 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 want it I want it flinch. Like uh, all glove, no bat is the more popular way of saying that, I believe. And, and then to shorten yeah. that, you could just say he's all glove. Or he's a glove guy. I feel like those are more common. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of ways to skin that cat, I think. Yeah, I don't really say good field, no hit. Well, no. So then he, start. Went, he went on to play for the Chicago White Sox. At the time, major leaguers worked in the spring and summer and were off the rest of the year. Berg used his baseball earnings to travel. He studied Sanskrit at the Sorbonne in Paris and wrote how much he enjoyed French wine, women, and song. Hell yes. That's the the tattoo I have in my ribs. Um, I've got a comment. Comment it away. I think languages back in that time period is the way to go. Think so? Why? I think it'd be more convenient now to know multiple languages. Yes, but I think it's kind of minimal books. Um, Like, A, once you start learning the love languages, I think the other ones kind of connect. Like, if you know a little Spanish and French, Italian, German, they all start to connect a little bit. And, again, like, I don't know, if you're doing history or research, like, there was no Google back then. Um like you just get a couple language dictionaries and you read a couple books in those languages, you're good. You don't have to like research stuff. <laughs> I think it's much easier to have like YouTube videos that pronounce it for you and then you talk back to it or books on tape that you can listen to. It's got to be way I'm, easier. I mean, everything's way easier, but I'm thinking about the compare and contrast of having to do anything else. I'm not seeing the benefits. Yeah, you're missing out. Good thing you weren't alive back then. Well, he's teaching himself Sanskrit while in Paris. This guy's weird. Yeah, I mean, he's a language freak. Once you go into the Sanskrit, you're done. (laughs) You've gone too far. Uh, But baseball, oh, so on. Largely to appease his father, Berg also enrolled at Columbia Law School. Dude's a major league baseball player, like making money, traveling around, and it's like, got to make my dad happy and go to Columbia. Damn. So he arrived late to spring training while finishing his first year. The following year, the White Sox owner denied Berg's request to arrive late again. So Berg arranged to leave school early and make up his courses. He'd go on to pass the bar and join the firm Satterley and Canfield. What's going on here? What is this guy, a professional baseball player, a college student, or a lawyer? Yeah, I don't know. I kind of dislike this guy. Um, this <laughs> right now, he feels like the guy. You're you're at a party or something, and I, I again back in the day, it's even worse. But I don't know. I used to work electrical supplies and be like, oh yeah, I do marketing in the electrical supply distribution industry. And then someone else is like, oh well, you know, I played a little pro ball. Now I'm a lawyer, and you're like, oh fuck me, huh? Um, <laughs> like I think this guy's the same thing, except I don't know the jobs. Jobs back then are like, oh, the street sweeper. And it's like, oh, lawyer that plays pro ball. You know every language? Get out of here. <laughs> yeah, guy, guy's too good at everything. Anyway. Like, you don't let him at, like, your local watering hole. No, no, no. No. He's not normal. Well, baseball not, was one his, of the guys. Baseball was his priority and ultimately how he made his living throughout the 1930s. He said he would rather be a baseball player than a Supreme Court justice. Yeah. Yes, yeah, same. Every Supreme Court justice would rather be a professional athlete. Who the fuck would rather be a Supreme Court justice? Don't no, who? Put like that Supreme evil on, Court justices. Don't put that evil on our, our Ruth, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Um, 
I think she's taking her gig all day. Um, but yeah, no, I'll I'll take the pro athlete over. Actually, I don't know, Supreme Justice job for life. What do you really do? <laughs> job the job security is pretty high. Best job security in the world. In 1927, what, how stupid is the Supreme Court justice that they give out jobs for life until you die? We could probably. It's like the most important I, I, people passing the most important laws, and they could be like so dumb and dated. We're like, nope, they're 97. Do you think gay marriage should be legal? And they're like, no. Like, okay, seal that vote up. <laughs> RBG has literally dedicated the f- like final years of her life to staying alive so that Donald Trump can't replace her in the Supreme Court. Man, what a dumb system. Like that's where that's where we're at, people. <laughs> <laughs> they should change that. Well, in 1927, White Sox catcher turned manager Ray Schalk in a in a pinch during a game called out to the bench asking if anyone could catch. Oh, go fuck yourself. He does not even a catcher and he's like, "I can do it." Berg tried to volunteer the player next to him, but Schalk thought Berg, a shortstop, was volunteering and put him in without being corrected. Now that's pretty good. <laughs> you try well, to throw your buddy under the bus and then you're out there catching? No, he wasn't trying to throw his buddy under the bus. He His buddy next to him yeah, was a He was a trying to catcher. volunteer his friend, right? Because he was a catcher. Oh, I thought his friend wasn't a catcher. Uh, I don't know. I It doesn't say one or the other. I, I'm guess. I mean, they're saying they're looking for a volunteer catcher, which makes me think they don't have a catcher. So he's volunteering his buddy. I think he's being kind of a jerk face. Oh, and maybe he, his he buddy wanted to in. catch. I don't know. But anyway, yeah. maybe like they're finally like they're setting Berg up. Like finally, we're gonna find something this dude's not good at. Just throw him behind the plate and see him get his ass kicked. Okay. Well, Berg said, "If it doesn't turn out well, please send the body to Newark." Berg told his teammates, but he took nobody to ca- laughed at that joke. No. Nobody laughed at that joke. He took to catching. He and his second baseman communicate about the opposing team's base runners in Latin. Oh my God, dude. I wanted to like Mo Berg so much. Imagine being on the field and like they're talking a language that literally doesn't even exist anymore because it, everyone died and they're talking a dead language like just yelling out the signs. I hate this guy. Hey, I'm just I'm just going to draw the pitches in Sanskrit. So <laughs> keep up. Dude, the next line is if the runner trying to steal second understood Latin, Berg said they'd switch to Sanskrit. I mean Hey, how do you know? When the runner gets to second, hey, do you speak Latin, chap? Maybe they just caught on. Why are they yelling signs to each other? They're just doing this to piss each other off. There's hand motions in place. Imagine they're being literally the just doing it to show off they speak a different language. You're one of the middle. No, the middle. Inf- you think there was another player on the team that knew Sanskrit? No. Well, Berg Mo said Berg went. Moberg went out of his way to teach these guys the, basic language because he could. He taught them like the five words that meant steal yeah. and stop in Sanskrit, just just to show off that he knew Sanskrit. Yeah, it's unnecessary. His linguistic skills inspired this observation by a teammate. He can speak seven languages, but he can't hit in any of them. Get him! Get yeah, him. I mean, his teammates <laughs> loathed him. <laughs> They probably did, man. Uh, Okay, so in Japan, he goes to Japan. He made two trips to Japan for baseball, it it says in quotes, in the 1930s, capturing panoramic footage of Tokyo that is believed to have been used to plan the 1942 Doolittle Raid, the U.S.'s first bombing raid on Japan in World War II. With Japan already at war with China, the Japanese government was becoming increasingly militarized. Japan and China clashed for a while. 
Meanwhile, Japanese citizens were growing interested in America's favorite pastime. In 1932, Berg was among a group of major leaguers sent to Tokyo to coach Japanese college players in hitting, base stealing, and other skills. When the tour ended and Ted Lyons and Lefty O'Doul returned home, Berg stayed, traveling around Asia by himself. Gross. He ended his trip in Berlin, and he saw firsthand the beginning of Adolf Hitler's rise to power in Germany, along with then-Italian Prime Minister Benito Mussolini's fascist influence on the Nazi movement. Is a Jewish guy just traveling there, like, all willy-nilly? Seems dumb. For such a smart guy, seems dumb. Yeah, I mean, like, what vibes was he picking up? I mean, unless he, I mean, it's all spy shit. I, I don't know if this was spy stuff yet, but it seems silly. All right, well, in 1934, the Soviet Union briefly invaded China, and with tensions rising in the Pacific, the U.S. sent an all-star roster of American League players on a tour of Japan to compete against Japanese teams in a friendly 18-game series? Love you can't that. you can't call that a series. I love that. Yeah. Do you think so 18 divided by 2, do you think when a team won 10 games they just didn't play the last 18? This was just an 18 game tour. 18 game series. Yeah, I think you might be getting hung up in series a little bit. It's probably not what we yeah, what just, we just, consider just a series a, now. It's just yeah. a tour. It's just a traveling yeah. baseball show. The players would also serve as goodwill ambassadors as the All-American Japan Tour was an attempt to bolster Japanese-American relations through a shared interest in baseball. Man, this really went to shit, huh? That didn't work at all. We bombed The U.S. bombed the fuck out of Japan. Japan yeah. did Pearl Harbor. The baseball didn't save us? Mo Berg's a failure? I mean, I, I've been thinking that about Mo Berg. I don't, I don't know about the other details. All right. Well, while Berg had set a league record for catching 117 games straight without an error, error, he didn't have the same Hall of Famer status as other recruits like Babe Ruth, Lou Gehrig, Earl Avril, and Lefty Gomez. But he had been to Japan before, and when catcher Rick Farrell dropped off the All-American roster just before tour, Berg readily accepted the invitation. He studied. I was going to say, dude, I, I think we... I was going to ask if this was the same trip we talked about with the babe that they need to make a movie on, and apparently they partially have with, with Paul Rudd, the catcher in the rye. <laughs> but yeah, so he, he went to Japan, even though he couldn't hit, even in any language. He studied Japanese on the deck of the ship during the three-week journey across the Pacific. He didn't know Japanese what a already? Loser. What an idiot. What a loser. How did he not know Japanese already? He, why would you hey, learn we're going to... He wore you learn we're gonna do before Jap Japanese. We're gonna do push-ups and pound beers below deck. You in? No, I'm gonna I'm gonna read some Japanese up up top. Get out of here, Berg. Upon arriving, oh, Babe Ruth peed on this guy. I bet you a hundred bucks. Ooh. Yeah, I would I would be interested to see if there's any Babe Ruth quotes on Mo Berg because yeah, not a fan. Oh, Babe Ruth was. Can stand. I'm gonna Google it right now. Babe Ruth, Mo Berg. Let's see if anything comes up. First, I'll do images. Is there a picture of the two of them? No. Mm. No, I don't think so. Suspect. You want me to Google what he looks like? Mo Berg. Okay. Yeah, I don't like him. Okay. I think this guy's an American war hero, and we're kind of shitting on him. Yeah, I'm hoping we have a turnaround here. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm picturing like I'm picturing Moberg's grandkids like hopping on Google and being like, "Oh, they did a podcast on on Grandpapa." <laughs> Grandpapa. Like, oh, these guys, these guys are kind of assholes. <laughs> Upon arriving, Babe Ruth heard Berg greet a fan in Japanese. Ruth said he thought Berg claimed not to know Japanese. Berg said that he hadn't a few weeks before. Berg traveled with a 16 millimeter Bell and Howell movie camera, seemingly undeterred by leaflets distributed by police warning people not to make maps or capture images. 
which a Japanese Japanese feared could be used against them in a war. Crazy times that they all knew like a war was coming. Like, hey, right? you can come play baseball here, but don't memorize our city street layout because we may be going to war soon. But please imagine tell if, us about the baseball. Imagine if they tried to do no pictures in like a town. Yeah. New York City was like no pictures. Be wild. Don't what would happen if you tried to take a picture? Bullet comes out of your iPhone and kills you. We went to that place in LA that taped up our cameras. Right, but that was like a small, very controlled indoor area. Yeah. Not like a city. Tough. I mean, video cameras barely existed. The only guy, like Moberg, yeah. knowing how to use a video camera also was like very Moberg of him. Yeah, that's a good call. Um, he also carried an official letter of introduction from U.S. Secretary of State Cordell Hull. On one occasion, Berg peeled off from his teammates and went to the roof of a Tokyo hospital, then the city's tallest building. He wore a Japanese kimono and slippers, and he had flowers and an alibi that he was visiting an ambassador's daughter who just had a baby. But he threw out the flowers and ended up on the roof, where he shot a panorama of the Tokyo skyline, including the harbor and industrial centers. The U.S. would later use the shots as reconnaissance footage to inform wartime military strategy and planned bombing raids. How Berg delivered the footage to the U.S. government remains murky. He was known for answering questions about his government work by putting his finger to his lips and saying, shh. See, they had me for a second. They had me on Moberg's side, and I was like, that's kind of badass that he like snuck up there, got in the robe, that's some like sneaky spy shit, took the films, and then with the shh, he lost me again. And I was like, oh, it's just nerdy fucking Moberg. Yeah, I mean, that's... So, all right, let's 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 do the good and the bad, a.k.a. the Moberg story. <laughs> badass that he threw on a kimono went on the roof of the hospital, and filmed around. Two things that suck. We don't know how he got it back. Like, did he just take it on the boat? I'm, I mean, guessing, that seems he like just, an I'm easy... guessing he just handed it to a guy who handed it to a guy who handed it to a guy. Yeah, I mean, it seems like an easy fix. If you came over on a boat, you just take it back on the boat. Um. And then B, and again, this turns into our, maybe we're being too tough on Moberg. Like, was that the only reconnaissance they had? Or is this a little gimmicky? That's what I need to know. You know what this story is very much like? Um, and we did this on Last from the Past. Um, uh, what's the pilot's name? Woman pilot. That is Amelia great. Earhart. Amelia Earhart. Like, they knew that this dude was going to Japan for baseball. So they turned it into a spy mission when in Amelia Earhart's case, they knew she was traveling around the world. So a lot of people think that the U.S. turned that into a spy mission to film the harbors of the islands that Japan had used. It's the same exact thing. Kind of they're using uh, uh, a national tour that's getting attention for good reasons and using it as spy. Now, in Mo Berg's case, we know this is true. We don't know if Amelia Earhart's saying I remember when we did the episode, you didn't think so, and I definitely did. Yeah, I was skeptical of Amelia. There there were some holes that didn't connect in my brain, but that's kind of how my day-to-day operates. Um, yeah, no, I I mean, up to this point, Moberg's done well. Like, I'm, I, I would be very interested to know, I mean, was Moberg's video their, like, A-plus game plan, game tape? Or was Moberg's tape, like, all right, we put together a pretty good plan. This is some video from the rooftop of the hospital that Mo Berg took in a kimono, and then all the guys start laughing. <laughs> They're like, wait, who? who where did we get this video on? Well, we got a baseball player. He sent it to us just in case we needed it, but like, we have real maps and stuff. Yeah. So, I, again, hey, pretty cool kimono, spy, rooftop. That's fun. Um, would, would like a little more on it. 
All right. So during World War II, he retired his Red Sox uniform to work for the government. Japan's attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941, killed more than 2,300 Americans and catapulted the U.S. into World War II. Millions of Americans joined up. Before Berg's father died in 1942, he asked his sons, why aren't you contributing to this war? Damn. I was, I was just, wow, I was just going to ask, do you think Mo Berg's dad is proud of him? The, the seven-language baseball player who went to law school? Do we know if he graduated? I think he did. Um, damn. So, yeah, I was going to ask if, his, if, his da- if you thought his dad was proud of Mo Berg, and I think that, that line answered that question. Seems like a never-proud guy. Kind of a tough break. Yeah. Maybe that's why Berg's chasing for a father's approval. Well, and we've been against Mo Berg this whole time, and here we are. Berg left the Red Sox to work for the Office of Inter-American Affairs and Government Agency. President, Ro- President Franklin Roosevelt founded the counter-axis propaganda in Latin America. In February 1942, Berg made a radio broadcast addressing the people of Japan in Japanese, asking for peace. He identified himself as a friend of the Japanese people and urged listeners to avoid a war you cannot win. Yo, I I know that we've been laying it on thick. I hate Mo Berg. Imagine, Imagine like broadcasting yourself to the nation of Japan, speaking probably choppy Japanese. Saying like, hey, I'm a friend of Japanese people. You do not want war. Like thinking that the nation of Japan's going to listen to the backup catcher from the Red Sox. Like well, they're la- the he- nation of Japan is laughing in Moberg's face while he's making that broadcast. Yeah. I mean, he they turned it off when he said, my name is Runt Wolf. <laughs> like that. Everyone stopped listening. You probably know me by my childhood pseudonym. Runt Wolf. He probably thought they did know him as Runt Wolf. And yeah, I mean, I again, we're a guy who's <laughs> kind of known as an American hero. <laughs> my yeah, I mean, my instinct to right now, what I want to say is like I'm. You mentioned choppy Japanese. I'm picturing him just slaughtering, <laughs> just full confidence. But like I don't know, like the Austin Powers scene. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's funny. That that um, that summer, his work took him to Central and South America, ostensibly as a goodwill ambassador distributing baseball gear. He fed reports on the political situation to his boss, Inter-American Affairs Coordinator Nelson Rockefeller. In the wake of Pearl Harbor, Roosevelt recognized the importance of strong foreign intelligence to the Allied war effort. In 1942, he signed an executive order forming the OSS, a clandestine espionage and sabotage agency directed by General Wild Bill Donovan. Donovan was a Republican and was Roosevelt's Columbia Law classmate and a World War I general turned Wall Street lawyer. As the founding father of America's CIA forerunner, Donovan recruited a diverse cast of military and civilian personnel whom he fondly regarded as his glorious amateurs. So this dude, I don't know, another Mo Berg that does more smart things, and then he formed a secret agent called Glorious Amateurs, which is kind of a rude name. At its John, pe- yeah. Have you been on Mo Berg's baseball reference yet? No. Go look at the stats. Okay, I'm excited. Are they going to be, like, god-awful? It doesn't help where we're currently at with Mo Berg. That's all I'll say. Yeah, he was a really bad baseball player. Lifetime batting average of 243. Lifetime on base percentage of 278. OPS is 577. Now, they did say he couldn't hit, Jake. Negative 4.3 career war. <laughs> <laughs> that means he he hurt his teams more than he helped them. For anyone that played know. fifteen years in the MLB, yeah, a lot of the years. Like in nineteen thirty eight, he just played one game. 
two innings. Seven games. I don't know. He was a he was a backup glove guy. So now he, I he, mean, he couldn't have been getting at, paid that much. With all his skills, he could have got a higher paying job than being a poorly paid bad baseball player. Like you said, we're laying it on thick. Do you think there's any chance that Moberg was like a crazy well liked person? On the baseball field? Yes. Not at all. He was the know it all okay. backup catcher. Okay. All right. So at its peak, the OSS employed some 13,000 men and women with personnel stationed across the world, working not only as a field agent, but also as code breakers, researchers, map makers, psychologists, scientists, and propagandists who carried out special operations and information warfare. Berg was recruited in 1943. With his unusual aptitude, agility, language skills, and information gathering experience, he doesn't have any of that. Berg became the OSS agent that Donovan designated to support the government's top secret initiative to develop its first nuclear weapons, codenamed the Manhattan Project. It was an undertaking so covert that Roosevelt supposedly didn't even tell then Vice President Harry Truman about it. Well, I probably just hated Truman. If you don't tell your vice president about a covert operation, you probably just hate your vice president. Because come yeah. on, come on, let him know. Leading researchers and scientists, including Albert Einstein, briefed Berg, teaching him what they hoped would be sufficient background on atomic energy and their adversaries. Efforts so Berg could collect vital information and assets from occupied Europe. I guarantee when Einstein tried to talk to Berg, Berg like responded in Sanskrit, like being coy, like, you know, yeah. we're smart. We both know Sanskrit. And Einstein was like, oh, well, get out of here. No, he definitely need. He said it like greetings in Latin. And Einstein was like, yeah, but no, we're here to stop nuclear war. So stop showing off your language skills. We don't care at all. In 1944, Berg moved throughout war-ravaged Italy to track down important Italian scientists and documents in danger of falling into Hitler's hands. I see Mo is still catching very well, Roosevelt said after learning Berg had located and extracted Italy's foremost expert in aerodynamics, Antonio Ferri. Ferry had destroyed lab equipment that could help the Axes and gone into hiding in the mountains with a crate of scientific documents. He raised a resistance circuit carrying out guerrilla operations to thwart the Axes and enabled Allied airdrops. Berg and Ferry connected and began parsing and translating the scientific documents. All right, that's cool. Found so there, Berg's trapped on the mountain with this guy, or did he bring him down from the mountain? Um... Located and extracted Italy's foremost expert in aerodynamics. And then they used him to help, I think. Okay. I'm not positive. Had an A-plus president joke in there. Okay. With special... That was a... That's a classic. If the president says it, you do a belly laugh. Anyone else says it, and you're you get punched in the arm. Yeah, I don't think it's a real quote. With special permission... I just don't believe in a lot of quotes. It's kind of... My crutch. It's tough. Just like whenever they put like a chimey little like sitcom esque joke in quotes, like who you, you, who wrote that down when he said it? Sounds like well, a I quote mean, they made it, up after the fact. Yeah, I mean, maybe they had a lot of time to think about it. I, I don't know. I could see the president making making that joke with special permission from Roosevelt. Ferry entered the U.S. with a suitcase and the crate of documents as when es and was escorted to the nation's leading aerodynamics research center in Langley, Virginia. Okay, so this dude, Ferry, was Italian, and he stole a bunch of shit from, the, from Italy and was hiding in his own country, I believe. I could be so wrong. That's how I'm reading this. Okay. And Berg went and founded him, brought him back to the U.S. Roosevelt, like, said, yeah, come on, let's figure this, what the secret papers are. So good job by Berg there. Job Berg. His mission. Berg's mission. If the Axis powers were making progress, it would likely involve German nuclear physicist Werner Heisenberg. 
a Nobel Prize winner who remained in Germany during the war. In December 1944, Berg was sent to neutral Switzerland for a conference at the University of Zurich with a pistol, a cyanide tablet, and a false identity as a Swiss physics student. His mission was to intend an intimate lecture that Heisenberg was giving at the conference. If Heisenberg's mentioned working on a nuclear bomb, Berg was to stand up and shoot Heisenberg point blank with the understanding that this would also mean he had to kill himself with the cyanide tablet. Damn. Yeah, I mean, we've stumbled into our first thing we can't mock about Mo Berg. Uh, I mean, sit in front row of a guy's presentation with the gun on you, knowing that if he says a couple fishy words, you have to kill him and then yourself. That's a tough spot. Just sitting there like, don't fucking say it, dude. Fingers crossed, legs crossed. Like, don't say it. Don't say it. Don't say it. <laughs> Moberg had everyone from his past that bullied him for his different languages. Like, ah, oh, couldn't even couldn't even hit the scientist from point blank, huh? <laughs> Well, between the German language and the deeply technical physics terminology, Berg left the lecture unsure of what Heisenberg knew. Okay. Thank God, God damn it. He just didn't want to kill himself, dude. I'm totally with Mo Berg on this one. I would have 100% left that meeting and been like, I don't know, guys, maybe, but I couldn't tell because I didn't want to kill someone and then kill myself. I mean, I get that, but I mean, it's gone against everything we've known about Mo Berg. Dude, dude learned Japanese on a boat in a week, but he goes to this special mission and he's now he's confused. I don't know. So Berg ended up complimenting Heisenberg on his talk and later insisting on escorting him to his hotel. In, res- in the resulting report, which was read by Roosevelt, Berg determined that Heisenberg had low confidence in the German effort and that Hitler was at least two years behind the Manhattan Project. So we did. So, okay. I mean, if we liked Mo Berg in this world, he's he took this guy to the hotel bar and just broed out about atomic warfare for a couple hours to get the skinny. I mean, I, I like that. Yeah. And then he said, you know what, president, they don't know nothing. They're way behind. Two years. In the end, Berg declined the Medal of Freedom in 1946. Oh, that's such a Berg mood move. Yeah. To be above the medal that they're trying to honor you with. Yeah. He never married or had children. Oh, uh, yeah. You think anyone would marry Ooh. Mo Berg? Tough. I mean, that's a tough ask. So I guess his grandkids aren't listening. He would he would say something like, you know, I never met my match. Like no one could keep up with him. Woman only talks two languages, you're out. He led my, a My mission my mission was to play baseball and serve and someone's like, "You sucked at baseball." <laughs> <laughs> he led a nomadic existence, traveling and in his later years, living with his sister, Ethel, in New Jersey. Don't we think he's kind of... Well, I guess... All right, so let's go back on this quote, because he said early on he loved going to France for the wine and the women. So he's either a creep or loser or somewhere in between. Maybe that was just a line he said because he was actually gay, and instead of... Uh, talking, broing out with Heisenberg, he fucked him. Ooh, that would be in my movie. And then he was, that's why he never married. But also he never married because no one could stand living with Moberg. He's unlovable. <laughs> Ethelberg. Tough, tough episode. If this guy is a, is really a huge war hero, we're sorry. <laughs> I need you to know that. <laughs> Ethelberg accepted his Medal of Honor after his death and donated it to the National Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, New York, where it is on display, along with his catcher's mitt and passport. 
I'm going to, I'm going to un, so that's the end of the story. And I feel terrible about it <laughs> like yeah. I didn't go into it thinking I was going to dislike Mo Burke. I mean, war heroes in baseball are your two. That's it's, like your highest compliments. It's right up my alley. Yeah. I thought I was really going to like it. I'm going to unmute producer Luke, who's in on this show. Unmute him yourself. Cause I want to know Luke when you read and wrote this episode, did you know where it was going to go for us? Well, I didn't think that you guys were going to not be able to stand him as uh, much as you <laughs> did. You could tell by the intro that I was trying to highlight all the positive things that he was able to do and it feels like they kind of just turned negative throughout it. <laughs> did you look at his baseball stats? Yeah. Did you? You think we'd make fun of him being terrible? No, not really, considering all the, the, the war hero stuff, you know? Right. No, I mean, I think we would have thought the same thing, <laughs> but it just didn't pan out. <laughs> it just, just did not happen. I wanted to like Mo Berg. I really did. Not for nothing. Jim, I, I think I'm going to pin most of this on you, because a lot of it was the delivery. <laughs> that's not fair i was just reading words I, I mean if you say like oh wow this this dude could do seven languages you're like okay try hard new seven languages i mean i'm gonna go off of that too well that's what it said that's what he did we like dd we like dd gregorius he speaks a bunch <laughs> of languages dude the, when he was yelling the signs to the second baseman in latin yeah. and then switching it to sanskrit that's an unlikable guy yeah no i'm with you <laughs> <laughs> like no one thinks that's cool besides Moberg. Oh God. Jim, this might be the first one. Like I almost want you to reach out to some old like just an old man researcher and be like, hey, was Moberg well liked? Cause all the context clues are giving us a no. Yeah. All right. Well, anyone listening to this episode. Let us know and I'll reach out. But Luke, do you think we're going to get backlash for how mean we were to a guy who got the, what do you get, Medal of Honor? He turned it down. He didn't get it. Ugh. Do you think it's wrong that his sister accepted the Medal of Freedom after he died when he didn't want it? She donated it. So I was going to shit on her if she accepted it and didn't like donate like it. Like I'll take it because <laughs> she hated him. She donated it right away, though, to the National Baseball Hall of Fame. And they were like, OK, we'll take it. I mean, the guy sucked, but sure. Somehow Mo Berg's now in the Hall of Fame with his 240 batting average. Another weird thing that I kept out, Jim, because I know that you hate the death talk, <laughs> was the article I read ended with his sister cremated him and spread his ashes in Israel. But the final line was, no one knows where his remains are today. Sounds like they're sprinkled in Israel. What are we talking about here? Yeah, that's why I didn't include it. <laughs> Whole article seems shoddy now. <laughs> I this is tough. All right. Well, I'm on, I'm, I'm on his wiki now. I'm on his Wikipedia now, looking for something to like about him. Do you well, in the Baseball Reference, they have his burial as just cremated. Do they have that for every player? Hey, I, I got something. Well, actually, Jim, you're not going to like this because it's an old quote. But they have... Okay, this will be a fun game. What a, a nurse at the Bellevue, New Jersey hospital where he died recalled his final words as... What do you think they were? Long live America. They weren't in English. I can guarantee you that. Luke, you want to stab at it? I saw this already. His final words were... How did the Mets do today? <laughs> I like that. I know. And that's what I was looking for something we could like about Moberg, and that's that's pretty good. I don't believe it, but I like it. I mean that's that's more recent than a lot. I mean that was nineteen seventy two. Nine what what day did he die? May twenty ninth. The Mets won that day. They did? Yeah. What if they got smoked? May wait, what day was it? <laughs> <laughs> what day was it? May 29th. Wow, 29th. they they won by one run. Wow, they were they were losing. The Mets were losing 6 to 3 and they scored 4 
in the ninth inning to get the win, all for Mo Berg. It's pretty good. Only baseball card on display at the CIA. It's something. That's something, yeah. Okay. You know how they won? <laughs> Hit by pitch, walk, pass ball, walk. <laughs> yeah, I mean. <laughs> That's a Mo Berg win. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think we need it. Well, I mean, it might be a while till we can connect these dots, but uh, n- know who we have to ask. Craig? Who's Craig? Oh, Calcaterra. Calcaterra. Yeah. Yeah, he'd, he'd be a good one. I was going to say Paul Rudd. I was going uh, just a step above Craig. Okay. Hey, well, if we ever have Paul Rudd on the show, which we've been told that may happen, we will we will ask him, hey, you played Mo Berg in a movie. Do you think people liked him? Yeah. Did it, and and he'll say researching... the American war hero? Yeah. <laughs> when, when you were researching Mo Berg, was there any question if he was well-liked or not? <laughs> That's such a funny question to ask Paul Rudd. I think... I think it's good. Uh, Okay. Write that one down, everyone, and remind us. Thank you for listening. This was Laughs from the Past, Season 6. If you enjoyed it, thanks. Uh, Go listen to the whole backlog. And if you think, you know, hey, why did these guys just shit on American War Hero? We apologize. Didn't mean to. We're not happy. We're not happy about it. But it's what what happened. (laughs) See you guys later. (laughs) Bye. Bye. Bye.